Some people ask the question of what good is math? What is the relationship between math and physics? Well, sometimes math leads, sometimes physics leads, sometimes they come together because, of course, there's a use for the mathematics. For example, in the 1600s, Isaac Newton asked a simple question. If an apple falls, then does the moon also fall? That is perhaps one of the greatest questions ever asked by a member of Homo sapiens since the six million years since we parted ways with the apes. If an apple falls, does the moon also fall? Isaac Newton said yes. The moon falls because of the inverse square law, so does an apple. He had a unified theory of the heavens, but he didn't have the mathematics to solve the falling moon problem. So what did he do? He invented calculus. So calculus is a direct consequence of solving the falling moon problem. In fact, when you learn calculus for the first time, what is the first thing you do? The first thing you do with calculus is you calculate the motion of falling bodies which is exactly how Newton calculated the falling moon, which opened up celestial mechanics. So here's a situation where math and physics were almost co-joined like, like Siamese twins, born together for a very practical question, how do you calculate the motion of celestial bodies? Then here comes Einstein asking a different question, and that is, what is the nature and origin of gravity? Einstein said that gravity is nothing but the byproduct of curved space. So, why am I sitting in this chair? A normal person would say, I'm sitting in this chair because gravity pulls me to the ground. But Einstein said, no, 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 no. There's no such thing as gravitational pull. The Earth has curved the space over my head and around my body. So space is pushing me into my chair. So to summarize Einstein's theory, Gravity does not pull. Space pushes. But you see, the pushing of the fabric of space and time requires differential calculus. That is the language of curved surfaces, differential calculus, which you learn in fourth year calculus. So again, here's a situation where math and physics were very closely combined, but this time math came first. The theory of curved surfaces came first, Einstein took that theory of curved surfaces and then imported it into, into uh, physics. Now we have string theory. It turns out that 100 years ago, math and physics parted ways. In fact, when uh, Einstein proposed special relativity in 1905, that was also around the time of the birth of topology, the topology of hyperdimensional objects spheres in 10, 11, 12, 26, whatever dimension you want. So physics and mathematics parted ways. Math went into hyperspace. And mathematicians said to themselves, aha, finally, we have found an area of mathematics that has no physical application whatsoever. Mathematicians pride themselves as being useless. They love being useless. It's a, it's a badge of courage being useless. And they said the most useless thing of all is a theory of differential topology in higher dimensions. Well, physics plotted along for many decades. We worked out atomic bombs, we worked out stars, we worked out laser beams. But recently, we discovered string theory. And string theory exists in 10 and 11 dimensional hyperspace. Not only that, but these dimensions are super. They're super symmetric. A new kind of numbers that mathematicians never talked about evolved within string theory. That's what we call a super string theory. Well, the mathematicians were floored. They were shocked. Because all of a sudden, out of physics came new mathematics. Super numbers, super topology, super dif differential geometry. All of a sudden, we had super symmetric theories coming out of physics that then revolutionized mathematics. And so the goal of physics, we believe, is to find an equation, perhaps no more than one inch long, which will allow us to unify all the forces of nature and allow us to read the mind of God. And what is the key to that one inch equation? Supersymmetry, a symmetry that comes out of physics, not mathematics, and has shocked the world of mathematics. But you see, all this is pure mathematics. And so the final resolution could be that God is a mathematician. 
And when you read the mind of God, we actually have a candidate for the mind of God. The mind of God, we believe, is cosmic music, the music of strings resonating through 11-dimensional hyperspace. That is the mind of God. And what else can we do? We can also unlock the secrets of the Big Bang. You see, Einstein's equations break down at the instant of the Big Bang and the center of a black hole. The two most interesting places in the universe are beyond our reach using Einstein's equations. We need a higher theory, and that's where string theory comes in. String theory takes you before the Big Bang, before Genesis itself. And what does string theory say? It says that there is a multiverse of universes. Where did the Big Bang come from? Well, Einstein's equations give us this compelling picture that we are like insects on a soap bubble, a gigantic soap bubble which is expanding, and we are trapped like flies on flypaper. We can't escape the soap bubble. And that's called the Big Bang Theory. String theory says there should be other bubbles out there in a multiverse of bubbles. When two universes collide, it can form another universe. When a universe splits in half, it can create two universes, and that, we think, is the Big Bang. The Big Bang is caused either by the collision of universes or by the fissioning of universes. If there are other dimensions, if there are other universes, can we go between universes? Well, that, of course, is very hard. However, Alice in Wonderland gives us a possibility that maybe one day we might create a wormhole between universes. This is a wormhole. Think of taking a sheet of paper and putting two dots on it. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. But if I can fold, if I can fold that sheet of paper, then perhaps I can create a shortcut. A shortcut through space and time, called a wormhole. This is a genuine solution of Einstein's equations. We can actually see this in string theory. The question is, how practical is it to go through one of these things? We don't know. In fact, there's a debate among physicists today. Stephen Hawking, many physicists are jumping into the game of trying to figure out whether it's physically possible to go all the way through a wormhole. Because if you could, then you might be able to use this as a time machine. Since string theory is a theory of everything, it's also a theory of time. And time machines are allowed in Einstein's equations, but to build one is extremely difficult. Far more energy is required than a simple DeLorean with plutonium. You know, trillions of years from now, the universe is going to get awfully cold. We think the universe is headed for a big freeze. All the stars will blink out. Stars will cease to twinkle. The universe will be so big, it'll be very cold. At that point, all intelligent life in the universe must die. The laws of physics are a death warrant to all intelligent life. There's only one way to escape the death of the universe, and that is leave the universe. We are now, of course, entering the realm of science fiction, but at least we now have equations, the equations of string theory, which will allow us to calculate if it is possible to go through a wormhole, to go to another universe where it's warmer, and perhaps we can start all over again.